Afternoon, ladies and gents. Simon Brown here doing today's webcast on when to sell long-term investments. About 30 minutes, got time for questions. Pop them into the Q&A box as they come up. Uh, if, if they're not time sensitive, I'll take them at the end. Otherwise, I will pick up the questions as and when uh, they, they, they click through. I suppose the, the first point I want to reference back, let's look at traders first, typically fairly short term, uh, in other words, less than three years. I get that three years from South African Revenue Service, SARS. You say they use that line in the sand. If you hold for longer than three years, you pay CGT. Less than three years, it is considered to be income. And really, for a trader, it's about price. Nothing else matters. It's just about price. Uh, probably using de derivatives rather than maybe using derivatives. And of course, because it's price, it's technical analysis is really what the focus is. And that is opposed to an investor. Now, an investor's long term. That's measured in decades. It's certainly plus three years, but it's measured in, in, in decades. My long-term portfolio, I call till death do us part. Now, I want to hold these shares until I die or they die. It's going to be a fundamental approach. Exactly how those fundamentals are going to depend on the individual. Different folks will go different levels of, levels of depth, discount cash flows and the like, price earnings, return on equities. Dividends are important. And even if it's not the, the key focus up front in terms of living off or spending the dividends, obviously they're being reinvested. That cash flow is always important. Price paid, massively critically important. Always, always important. And the reason I say that is because the price you pay is the one thing you have full control over in that you can walk away if you don't like the price. And of course, price doesn't equal value. We mustn't confuse those two. Price is what you pay. Value is what you get. Well, if you pay a right price. And it's it's that big picture, whether it be a, 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 a geographical, whether it be sector specific, um, big picture always important. And as I said, my portfolio, I call it till death do us part. I want to hold these shares pretty much forever. And I think I was running through the other evening uh, stocks that I've sold from my portfolio in the last uh, sort of 20 years. Uh, late 90s, I sold SAB Miller. That was a bad sale. Uh, Nedbank in the early 2000s, uh, Pick and Pay and Anglo in the early 2000s. Those three all very, very good sales in terms of what they did over the following decade or so. And then more recently, British American Tobacco. Uh, and we can touch on those in time if we want. So what are we looking for? In essence, we buy future profits in long-term investing. You, you buy a company, and what you're buying is that right to those future profits. Now, things such as rights issues and the like can dilute those future profits, but let's ignore them. It really is that future profit, in essence, cash generation that's going to come through. Internal cash generation of the company that ultimately turns into dividends. And those prices vary. So for us, it's about identifying the stocks that we like and then saying, well, when does it get to the price that we like? And that's market mood swings. We saw in October about a what, 10 or 15 percent uh, uh, sell off down from the highs of early July and, and gave opportunity in some stocks. Company sector uh, fundamentals are, are the focus, and it's critically important to buy winning stocks in winning sectors. There's no point in buying uh, a, a wannabe winner stocks in, in, in wannabe winner sectors or, or dog stocks in dog sectors, you know, um, and single commodity miners, construction are, are two of the sectors I stay from. You know, pick and pay is in the middle of a turnaround. Is it going to work? Sure. How long, at what cost? Those are the bigger issues. Go buy the winners. And if they stop being winners, we'll get the heck out and go buy the, the next expected. So, an investor stop loss. Stop loss is typically a, a phrase used in the in the uh, trading space, but we can use it in the investor space. It's just fundamentally different. It's not about price. As a trader, it is 100% about price. And that price might be a derivative. In other words, it might be an indicator or an oscillator, moving average crossover. Ultimately, that is still price. It's still a derivative of the price. An investor doesn't worry about the price. Simple reason. I mean, Ideally, we buy at the bottom and we sell at the top. In truth, we never get that even half right. So we buy halfway up, we sell halfway down, and, well, we just get beaten by costs and tax and, and missed, up, missed dividends, etc. So the investor doesn't worry about price. If you've got quality stocks in great sectors, the prices will vary. ShopRite hit north of 200, went down into the 130s. Would I have liked to have sold at 200 and change and buy again at 130? Yes, but I know I'm never going to time it. So I still hold my shop rights. 
Now, I, I, I got them. I think average in price is around 30. I'm still well in the profit. But over the, the many, many decades that I plan to hold ShopRite, assuming it remains a winner, I'm going to take myself some great profits along the line in terms of dividends and the like. So no stress on the immediate price. I ignore it. It's about that company. It's about the fundamentals. It's about what they do, where they do it, how they do it, and the profitability. And yeah, I'm thinking, I mean, you know, if ShopRite was ever unprofitable, no. Nah. I mean, if ShopRite started to lose money, I'd get the heck out of Dodge. If profit started to decline, I'd want to have a strong, hard look at them as to why. Is it a, a broader sector issue? What is going wrong in that particular space? The key point is, why did we buy the company? What attracted us to it? And this has a couple of issues. It means you know, doing your homework. I use a lot of Porter's Five Forces to help me define those companies that I'm going to like, that I'm going to want to invest in. Um, and we've got a review. If you go to Just One Lap, uh, if you go to the blog section, you'll see a review of Porter's Five Forces and how it works and how I use it. Um, I'm looking for, for industry leaders. And I, I have a, a, a very strict rule. In any particular sector, I'm only allowed to buy two stocks. Because if I can't decide which two, if I want to buy three, the truth is I can't decide. I can't differentiate. I walk away. Probably if I was braver, I'd say one stock a sector. And when I look at it, resources, I've got Billiton and Sassel. Uh, retail, I've got Woolies and ShopRite. Uh, financials, I've got a, 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 a Capitech and Standard Bank. So I'm kind of hedging my bets a bit, but I'm still always buying what I consider to be the, the absolute winners. Standard Bank's an interesting one. Of the big four banks, depending who you speak to, they'll each tell you, that, that, that a different one of the big four is the best one to hold. Um, and I can't help thinking to get to stand a bank and, you know, put my, my, hitch my wagon to, to Capitec in a sense. So it's why did you buy the company? That's what's critical. Winning stocks and winning sectors, but what makes that company, what makes that sector winning? That is critically important. And that's what we really need to understand. Why did we buy? So, you know, a bunch of reasons I've got here. And what I'm saying is, what are your top three? Don't give me a list of 20 reasons you bought. No, no. You need you need three. Is it is it a really great dividend payer? In other words, a very strong cash generator. Do they perhaps have a moat? All of our banks in South Africa have a moat, and that banking licenses are very hard to get hold of. It, it could be uh, mining exploration licenses. It, you know, what is that? It could be brand. I mean, Willie's in large part is brand more than anything else. So do they have a moat? Is it is it sector strength? Uh, perhaps it's it's about again. Let's go to retail, as we see with 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 uh, government social grants, with people moving up the the, the social ladder, moving up the LSMs. Um, we're seeing a sector, the food retail sector, incredibly strong. We can look at the, the food manufacturing sector from a continental perspective and say hey, there are a lot of people in Africa who need to be fed. Maybe it's a niche that they have, and, and, and you know, Meta springs to mind with their batteries. Um, uh, 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 Metcalf, Bola Metcalf springs to mind with their injection molding. Uh, Capitec springs to mind. Their niche is low-cost banking. Again, product. Maybe it's around that. It's around Capitec and the products that they're offering. So, so what are the, the things that really come to mind? Innovation. And again, Capitec would jump into that. Margins. Margins are a, a tricky one in a sense. If you've got a sector that has really good looking margins, you run the risk of competitors coming in because they want a slice of that action. And they know that their entry will reduce the margins, but it won't reduce the margins by such a killer amount that it still won't be massively profitable. So what I mean by margins is, for example, look at our food retailer. On the one sense, we've got pick and pay in an operating margin of 1.2%. We've got uh, ShopRite at about 5.8%. And ShopRite has, for over a decade, had the significantly better operating margin. Uh, it's still massively competitive. Walmart has tried to come in, or they have come in, there's success we could debate. But you don't want massively chunky margins. You want the margin winner within that space. Let's look at pick and pay and shop, right? I mean, when they go head to head, as, as they absolutely are, pick and pay has got their brand match. I mean, shop, right can come at them significantly aggressively simply because of their extra margin. So they could sacrifice profit to maintain or perhaps even pick up market share. So it's it's those sort of things. What are the things? What are the top three things that attract you to that stock? I mean, you did a lot of research. You did a lot of homework in that process. But while you were doing it and making notes and keeping records, there were some things you kept on coming back to and like saying, yo, that, 
And I remember for ShopRite, I mean, when I sold my pick and pays and entered ShopRite, I mean, one of the things that kept on coming back to me was the Africa expansion was interesting and the like, but the, one of the key things was, man, the operating margin at that point was about double what a, a pick and pay is. Now it's about uh, four and a half times what pick and pay. And that's partly ShopRite pulling ahead and pick and pay falling further back in the process. But I remember very clearly constantly just going back to those margins and saying, yo, these are huge. And ergo, that was one of my reasons for having them. So ShopRite, I mean, it is, they're the local leader. They're the leader in terms of innovation. They, they, and, and around that, I talk their, their tie-up with CompuTicket, their financial services that they have in terms of you can go and, and, and transfer money. You can buy tickets for Kalula and, and, and buses, and you can get your movies and, and, and your Grok concerts there as well. Um, the operating margins are, are huge. I've touched on that and their Africa strategy. And they're not a, a Johnny-come-lately in Africa, and they've learned the hard lessons. You can't just take a pick and pay or sorry, a shop route from South Africa and drop it in, in into Africa. In many cases, there aren't shopping malls as we traditionally know them. Um, there aren't the supply chains that we have. A large part of ShopRite's edge is supply chain. They're, they're central distribution centers. You don't get that when you go into a new territory and you've only got one or two uh, 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 you know, stores, even if you've got a dozen. You don't have that 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 central distribution. You don't have the suppliers and the working relationships. You know, you don't. Tiger Brands might not be there. Where do you get your your clover milk? So those are the three things that really got me. And and when would I look to sell Shoprite? Well, if Pick and Pay absolutely started eating their lunch, last set of Pick and Pay results, they lost market share, continued to lose market share. Last set of Shoprite results, they picked up more market share. Not a lot. In fact, a massively tiny amount, but they're there. I mean, and part of the problem is they start to cannibalize themselves locally. Their operating margins are insanely huge, 5.8%. Bigger in Africa, smaller in South Africa, we get that. And that number, frankly, I expect it to come down in these tougher conditions with pick and pay coming back. And also, I don't think for a retailer, a food retailer, 5.8 is sustainable. I frankly think if you're doing four, four and a half, I think you're doing awesome margins. So I expect that to come down. That won't stress me. If they came down to one and a half or two percent, stress me. I would be a seller. And then their Africa story, where they're doing incredibly well into Africa, becoming significantly more important. And you can see a picture down the line, maybe 10, maybe 20 years time, when ShopRite is Africa, where South Africa is just a part. We've got it with MTN, where, where Nigeria is their biggest uh, uh, profit generated EBITDA level. Uh, and you can see that starting to happen. Well, ShopRite's a long way away, simply because they've got so many South African stores. And they are market leader. MTN's not market leader in South Africa. Vodacom is. But you can see how massive Africa is going to be for them and, and, and how they very carefully but very, very, very succinctly doing it. And again, if you go to just one lap and go through to the, the article's infographics, you'll see an infographic on uh, ShopRite versus Pick and Pay. And, and, and on all the metrics, they're just whipping them. So I... The fact that ShopRite's gone from 200 and change to 130 and now up to 150 odd, I'm not sure exactly, doesn't bother me because what's my focus? Those are my three things that I worry about. And if I see those three starting to be eroded or one of them collapsing, then I give very serious consideration to selling my ShopRite at whatever the price happens to be. The point being is because I bought well, and what I mean by bought well, winning sector, winning stock, good price. I bought a lot of ShopRites in, in, in 2008 and 9 when the world was ending. And ShopRite wasn't under as much pressure as many others, but certainly it was. So because of that, even if I were to sell them tomorrow, I, I bought my average in 30. I had 150. I've made five times my money in uh, the last six or so years. So that would be my focus on why selling ShopRite. Let's look at Capitec, another favorite holder of mine. It's, it's approaching being a 15-bagger. My average in there is about 20. It's almost 300. What were the three things that really got me? Low cost. They offer bank accounts at 5 Rand 60. Full transactional bank accounts. I don't know what you pay for your bank account every month. I pay 285 Rand to have a private banker who I speak to once a year. He phones me on, on my birthday. And I'll be honest, when he phones me, I can't remember when he says, my name is X. It's like, okay, who are you? Okay, I'm the fool here. I get it. I should be moving. But low cost. And ultimately, what did they do? They went after the easy, what we call low-hanging fruit, right? The unbanked. 
They said, you can go and get a, a bank account for one of the big four, and you're going to get shabby service and pay crazy fees. Come to us, five rand sixty, and it's worked. They've signed up millions and millions of accounts. Now they're starting to expand it. Now they're starting to, 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 to grow their product range, and that's the other point there. So they started with loans and transactional banks. That's it. Nothing fancy. Gently moving into credit cards. You know that they're going to be doing home loans. The home loans they'll do via SA Home Loan. So they they might not make anything off it. They're just going to be a facilitator in the process. I'm not sure exactly how the deal would be. So let's say they make no money. But what are they doing? They, they, they're offering a, a broader picture to their client base. They're creating more foot traffic in their branches. They're creating more loyalty from clients. So that product growth, that customer growth. Now, product growth is interesting because at some point you have to say Capitex offering all the products. Ergo, product growth is no more. And at that point, customer growth probably at some point also certainly tapers off, maybe even kind of flatlines to a degree. And the difference between ShopRite and Capitec is that I bought ShopRite when it was already mature. I bought Capitec when it's still maturing. So there's going to have to be a, a, a mind shift to a degree. Low cost always, if Capitec suddenly says we don't do 5 rand 60 bank accounts, we only do 160 rand bank accounts, I'm out of there in a minute. They cost to income. This. So currently, Capitec's cost to income ratio is about the mid 30s, about 35%. It's been down to around 31, 32%. Um, but as, as they evolve and change, certainly cost to income has picked up to the mid 30%. The big four banks are in the mid 50s. That gives them a humongous advantage over the big banks. They basically make 20% more profit, 20 cents on every rand extra compared to the big banks. Now, can the big banks ever? get down to the mid-30s. No. I remember an interview with Jacob Murray where I said to him, because in the olden days, the big banks had cost to income ratios in the low 50s, 51, 50.5, that sort of range. 2011, I'm interviewing Jacob Murray on CNBC, and, I said, and their cost to income was 56. And I said to him, where does it, how much lower can you get the number? And he said to me, we're never going to get back into the low 50s. There's been a, a major shift in the cost of running a bank post the crisis of 08, 09. Regulation, compliance, that is expensive. So they stuck in the mid 50s. Let's say Capitec drifts up to the mid 40s. Still gives them 10 cents more on every rand that they make in terms of profit. That is humongous. If Capitec cost to income hits 50 or 6, 55, well, now I'm not so interested anymore. So the bottom one, I, at some point, I'm going to adjust it and I'm going to pull it out. And the one question is, you're not talking about loans and the like. It's a great point. And when I when I put together my list on Capitec and when I go back to my notes that I originally made, one of the points I liked was how aggressive they were on non-performing loans. And I forget exactly, but they write off an amount, and I think it's 30%, but for some reason that sounds wrong, when they give the loan. So on day one, they write some off. By the time you're three months in arrears, they write off every loan you have with them. So they're very aggressive. Compare that to African Bank, who were very unaggressive, and well, we know what happened there. So yes, that was important to me, but in terms of my top three, it didn't make it. And in truth, to a degree, there, I was, that, that gave me an element of risk, because I'm therefore not massively focusing on, on an area that is huge risk to Capitec. And I suppose if I'm truthful, if non-performing loans suddenly went completely insane and quadrupled and etc., well, then I might have to have a long, hard look. These were the three. And I suppose in time, and I have to eventually drop the customer product growth, maybe the NPLs come into that process. I'm not sure. I would go through my list. I would revisit Capitec. So there's an example of two stocks that are in my portfolio. As always, disclaimer, I, I own both. And if you go to my vanity website, uh, simonbrown.co.za, my portfolio is published there. And, and the three things that attract me to those two companies and what I would need to see a, a marked deterioration in one of those three before I'd be looking to sell either. So that exiting is about knowing why you bought the share. And I know that makes perfect sense, but I mean, think about some of the shares you have in your portfolio. Do you really know why you bought them? Was it a hot tip? Was it a rush of blood to the head? Was it perhaps a trade that went horribly wrong and you turned it into an investment? Can you quantify in a minute or two the three key reasons why you hold the stock? and therefore what you focus on. And that's your exit. If, they, if that ch changes markedly, if that changes to, for the worse, then you sell. And you're not going to sell. Let's say ShopRite suddenly started losing the plot. 
I'm not going to be selling them anywhere near their high. I'm 25% off their highs. That's fine because I'm not going to catch that high, so I don't even worry about it. What's important is that journal, is those notes. I've got notes from my first shop right purchase probably in 2003, if memory serves me correct. Uh, Capitec was much more recent. My first Capitec purchases were around 2007, if memory serves me correct. But I've got those initial notes. And oddly enough, some of them are handwritten, so then I, I photograph them, so I have a digital copy of them. And I store those. And I back them up everywhere. They're backed up on my PC. They're backed up on a RAID 5 drive, and also backed up into the cloud. So I can go back and review those original notes. Because maybe, and let's maybe, come to that screen, maybe I was wrong about something. I mean, as I said with Capitec, maybe the non-performing loans start to kill them. So I go back to my notes and, well, why weren't that a top three? And I say it again because it's so important. You're never going to catch the perfect top. You're never going to catch the perfect one. Don't even worry about it. Don't even try it. It would be great but without a time machine. And then here's something which I've been rolling around. Do I, don't I? After one, I decided to add it in. What I'm talking about in this webcast is simply because they are so I haul out a pen here and you get a red pen. Red is a good color. Cyclical stocks are those ones that do this. They kind of go nowhere forever and then a sudden burst and nowhere forever and then a sudden burst and nowhere. And obvious examples, construction, single commodity mining, they are not long-term investments long you have to trade them and you might hold them i mean if you bought marion roberts at 10 or 20 rand way back in the day you held them for five six maybe eight years before they hit 100 the problem is you really had to time the entry and that exit and particularly you had to time the exit so whilst those periods of, of, of boom might be quite nice they to me relatively i'm looking to hold these things forever and a day so the so very cyclical, the very cyclical I just stuff, them. I just construction, them. single credit mining, both, mining both, 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 they don't fit they don't into fit what I call a death cross part of portfolio. I have held them, I have held the construction, them. construction I've sworn off, off, and I will hold single quality. Yes. yes, when yes. the commodities when start the commodities to boom again, and I think we're easily I three to five years away from that happening, then I'll look at some single commodities. And we've got some great ones, Cobra Iron Ore, great stuff, but not at this point in the cycle. The Platinum guys, Implex in particular, but not at this point of the You don't want to don't hold want them to death to us part. Them Look at Anglo uh, Platinum. You could have bought uh, it at 80 bucks 10, 80 12 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, years ago I can't remember. Went to 1500, 1500 now 400. 400. Will it get back to 1500? Sure. Never, sure. Say never. never say never. But when? But yeah, and you had those boom days in 7 of crazy dividends. Will that happen again? But when? So I just stay away. So I just, I just say away. thanks, just say but thanks, uh, absolutely but, uh, no uh, thanks. Absolutely no um, um, so then, so then, don't panic. Don't panic. And this is very easy is to very say, easy sitting, to here, say sitting, here, sitting here, sitting here in a nice quiet office nice on a Wednesday or Thursday afternoon with a mature portfolio. What I mean by mature portfolio that's been growing for twenty odd years. Twenty odd years. But don't panic. Investing is about the long term. Don't, don't, don't panic about the short term moves. And even 2008, which was a short term move that played out over a year or more. Prices may be under pressure. Markets will crash. Markets will correct. But. Is it unique to the sector? Is it, is it the the generally sector? under pressure? The for market pressure. as a whole is under pressure. Like it was in 2008, like that little pullback we had in October. Ignore it. Is it a sector that suddenly it finds itself in a tight space? space? Such as we're seeing in the retail space right now. Retail is having a tough time of it. Will their day in the sun return? Sure, absolutely. But if you're in a space where you're in a space where you're in a stock, you're in the wrong stock. You're in the wrong stock. Don't wait for it to. Get out, and get out and go get in the right stock. You're simply not in the winning stock. You can argue that the market got it wrong. That's brave. Forget it. The market is just saying this is what we pay for. So if it's a broader so issue, a broader don't issue. worry about it. Don't worry about but if it's your stock that's taking the pounding, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it?
Another quick point on Another core ETFs. Point, we did a, a, a webcast on this webcast last week, and there is a video which you'll find there. There is a short URL yeah, link. My core ETF portfolios, portfolio I, I hold forever, unless I decide I'm in the wrong ETF. The wrong and, and ETF. So for example, I have a platinum ETF, ETF, and I'm scratching my head very hard about that. Um, I'm um, probably I'm down, down 10 or 15 percent on that ETF, and and. and Maybe I'd, uh, firstly, I would prefer palladium. Price is doing no better. Wrong in the idea that have a little bit of commodity in my portfolio, and it is little. But maybe I'm just wrong about that concept. But my other ones, my, my and I'm talking broad ones here. You know, my my top 40 ones, my my property ones, my mid caps, my international. I continue to hold. Importantly, if you have, for example, a ND25 or a Fini15 or a, a, a Resi10. ETF. That at some point that you're going to have to sell. And that's why I don't put those in my core portfolio. I trade them. The problem with putting them in your core, core portfolio is that, yes, the Indy's done brilliantly now, but one day that worm will turn and it won't be Indy in the sun or it will be Resi in the sun. Now you've got to sell your Indies and buy your Indies. So my core portfolio, vanilla, boring, bland, yes, old forever. There's a video on that there, and you can talk, that talk around, particularly talk building around, a talk. Building Your risks, price moves risks against you before you're able to determine to exit. Yes, yes that's yes, certainly going to happen. By the time I decide to exit, there are a lot of folks who've got out ahead of me. I get that. So my recap, price so my recap, is not price a key metric. Not it's not even part of the equation. Why did you buy? What are those three key reasons that you bought the stock? And focus on those. And then obviously keep track of the company, keep, keep track, track of results, track announcements, results, mergers, 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 know what they're doing, know how, how they're doing, doing pull, pull apart the results, pull read pull analyst read reports, go reports, listen to CEOs and analysts, CEOs and analysts talking, talking about the results, talk and, about the results and as and when, and they, as come when they come out. Folks, if you've got questions, Folks, if you've got questions, uh, uh, thank you, appreciate Short answer is yes. Long answer is not today. Um, I'll schedule one for later in November. So I'll go look at all the different stocks that I hold. As I said, if you go to simonbrown.coza, you'll find my portfolio. I will go and look through all the different stocks, and you can, uh, and I will pull each one apart and tell you what are the three key reasons why I hold that particular stock. Why did I sell British American Tobacco? British American Tobacco was a weird one. I put it to my death just part portfolio, but I knew that ultimately was a stock I had to sell. If your product kills your customer, it's a bad stock. And, you know, what we're seeing now is that America's smoking a whole lot less. There's a tweet I've just put out on Simon PB on Twitter, a chart around American smoking, and it is it is collapsing. It's gone from 4,000 cigarettes per smoker per year down to 1,000. Um, but they're picking up that, that slack demand in the East. But ultimately, the East will start to do the same crackdown. And that might be 10, 20, 50 years away. In Australia, if you were born after 1st of January 2000, it is illegal for you to smoke. New Zealand wants to pass a law that bans all smoking in the country. Smoking is on its way out. There will be a time, maybe not in my lifetime, there will be a time when smoking is viewed as you were just crazy. So I bought British American Tobacco knowing that ultimately I had to sell it. Can they reinvent themselves, e -cigs, electronic cigarettes? Maybe. But... What happened then was sitting on a crazy – defensive stock should be in a price earnings of 10 or 11. It was in a price earnings of double that, and I thought, I am taking the money, and I am running. So I sold my BTRs. I can't remember what I sold at. It was recently, a month or two ago. Um, I don't know if they've moved higher or not. I wouldn't be surprised if they do move higher, um, and I haven't – massively uh, repositioned the money. I've put some extra into MTN. I picked up some Capitex at 205 off the double downgrade, and I think I bought some Sassels as well. Ah, and I took up my null pades on Woolies. Colin, are you worried about Sassel given what's happening to crude and the RAND? The RAND, no. I, I mean, the RAND will go. It might go to 6, it might go to 12, it might go to 20. The RAND is the RAND. Crude is interesting. I... Crude oil above $100 just made no sense. Not in a global economy which is doing okay, but just okay. It is not. The global economy is not rocking. So, you know, that, 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 that's, you know, the pullback didn't stress me. I, I think 60 or 70 is probably fair for Sassel. It does put them under a bit of pressure. I was buying some Sassels in the low 600s. Um, that, that, that in hindsight is like, hmm, that was silly. There's risks around their Louisiana ethane cracker plant. At the moment, I've moved Sassel onto my hold list. In other words, I'm not adding to it. Uh, in the low 500s, it gets interesting, but I'm probably not going to add to it because I think there is downside risk to oil. I think there's risk with Louisiana. So for now, I'm just going to continue to hold it. 
Uh, yeah, so Frank, I mean, that's just that. I mean, ultimately, so shale's interesting. So Sassel's going to play in the shale game. That's what they're going to do in, in, in Louisiana with their ethane cracker plant. Um, shale's interesting in, the, in, in terms of the input price. And if anything, it could seriously benefit Sassel in that space. The bigger point is that this planet runs on oil. That is not going away anytime soon. And Sassel's a major player. And the beauty of oil, when you use it, it's gone. You can recycle many commodities, not oil, not wheat, not others, but silver, gold, platinum, copper, recyclable. Stefan, uh, finding hard time finding value for my long-term portfolio. Uh, I agree with you. It's a hard time. You say PSG Consult. I like them. They've been under pressure. I did own them, and then I sold them uh, just around their time of, of, of listing. I think we could see a little more pressure there. But for a longer term, I really do like them. Um, and and I'm, I'm sitting with you. I, I've got cash. So what am I looking at? MTN, if it comes down to the low 200s, I'm interested. Uh, Woolies is on my hold list. So even if it got to my targets of low 60s, I wouldn't buy. ShopRite below 130, especially closer to 120, I would be a buyer. I don't know if it's going to get there. Um, what else am I looking at? I'm looking at Richmond. I'm having a good hard look at Richmond. I don't own it at the moment. Um, I like it. I think the China concerns are overblown. I think long term, China is moving into more of a consumer nation. Very good for Richmond. Uh, the 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 weak economy in Europe is not helping, but that will that worm will turn in time. So I'm actually having a look at Richmond around the 90s. Um, and last time I had Richmond was in the 40s, and then it ran and I missed it. So truth being, I should stop looking and and, and start deciding. Uh, what else am I looking at? Clover? No. Calgra M3. I'm having another look at Calgra M3. Two small caps: Adaptati, Santova. I worry about them in just in terms of liquidity. I need to take fairly chunky positions, and I worry about that. Which ETS would you invest in as a new buyer? Colin, I would buy BBET40. But if we take it a step further, Colin, go and grab that video there. We'll just go to justonelap.com and search for building a core ETF portfolio. I've got a 30-minute video there I did two weeks ago on exactly the subject. Um, and, and the first one's BBET40. I will drop that in your uh, Q&A box. I'll send it to everyone. And then you wrap around that further ETFs coming through. Ladies and gents, I'm not seeing any more questions, uh, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, the video will be up uh, late today or perhaps Friday, uh, and of course, we'll be back and rocking. So next week, JSC Power Hour, 13th of November, if you're in Joburg or online, if you're not, um, at 5.30 at the, at the JSC, or as I said, webcast, uh, 10 things uh, that will matter for traders, investors in 2015, and I'm busy putting that list together. I had huge fun.